today my message to you is about your passion. Your passion. I want to pray. I just want to pray for clarity for me and for you that you can be open to hear the word of the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you will help me to speak your word. And I pray for the congregation. Lord, I pray that you give them hearts and ears that will receive your word today. In Jesus' name, and God's people say amen. 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 Regain your passion for God is the title of my message today. Now, regaining your passion that you once had, you know, we all are passionate. And I talked about how you can be passionate about something. But we are talking about our passion for God. And maybe you've never come to a place where you are actually passionate for God at all. You know, but you're here today and you're going to hear it. Amen? You're going to hear it. Let's look at Zephaniah. This scripture is really very powerful. God is passionate about his love for you. See, God himself is passionate. He is passionate. See, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, it says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now think about it. We always, God is rejoicing over you with singing. Think about it. I'm trying to, to visualize that. How that actually is. God is rejoicing over you with singing. Now, it is one thing when we are singing. But what do you think it will be like when God is singing? Now, in Revelation chapter 1 there, when John, the revelator, when he was caught up in heaven, he saw God and he felt as though he was dead. And the Bible said the voice of God himself, Jesus, his voice was like a rushing of many waters. Have you been to Niagara Falls? And the waters were falling. That's how his voice was. In Isaiah chapter 6, we also hear the day that King Uzziah died, when Isaiah was, he saw the Lord. And the Bible said, and one of the angels was singing, holy, 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 and the temple all the temple posts were shaken up and smoke came out of there. I, I just want you to see this sum to you now. I'm telling you this, and you know what you're thinking in your mind? You're thinking you're watching an ADC, AC, AD, ACDC concert or something where smoke is coming. They blow smoke out of the stage, supposedly to signify something great is happening. But I'm telling you, this is an angel singing. And because of his voice, the post of the temple was shaken up and smoke came out. That's how powerful an angel can sing. How much more can God sing? And if I, I just wanted to hear, God is singing over me. That means he's in so much love for you. And he never held back. And he has to sing. Now, many of you don't know the purpose of singing. And maybe that's why our praise and worship has never been so powerful. I, I just want to help somebody here. Uh, for you to sing, it reflects, it's, it's, it's for you to express your love in words. But you have to sing it. Songs are very powerful, but God is singing over you. How much more can we sing back to him? How much more can we sing back to him? And that's what praise and worship is. So when we gather to the house of the Lord and the, the worship team doesn't have to struggle to try to somehow 
do something so that we can, oh, I can feel it. Now I can sing. No, no. We make a decision. Man, this is, we are singing it to God. We are worshiping God. And, and we have to sing it from the bottom of our heart. And, and sometimes we feel like, well, Pastor David, you know, I'm just a, you know, I, I'm a quiet person. Well, that's when you actually need to sing. Because God loves sacrifice. When you don't feel like it and you do it, hallelujah. When you don't feel like it and you do it, I'm talking to somebody right now. God is waiting for you to open your vocals and begin to sing to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and we can sing to God. You can, you can, that's why we put the words here. Don't worry. I love Brother Ponziano. I do. That guy doesn't care. And praise God. And I have Brother Monday there. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what you think. He's in love with God. Amen. They're in love with God. When you get to the place, you don't care what people think. Turn to somebody and say, I don't care. I don't care what you think. Yeah, when you get, it's liberating. I'm telling you, if you get to a place like that, it's liberating. You're going to sing like nobody's watching. Who cares? Oh, I don't have a good voice. Sing. Sing to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. All those people that make all kinds of noises there at the Rough Rider game, they don't have good voices. That's what God is talking about. He is not asking you to have a good voice. This is not a, a Canadian idol thing. We are not into that. He wants you. It is worship. When you, all, when you raise your voice and you worship the Lord because you love him. When you love somebody, you don't care what other people think. Your focus is on that person. And God is saying he's rejoicing over you with singing. He doesn't care what the devil thinks. Oh, you think the devil cares? You remember how the devil came to he came to God and he said, God said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just roaming around. God said, I know you're up into your business of destroying people. But I know don't touch my servant, Job. That Job, he loves me. And the devil told God, yeah, do you think he loves you for nothing? You think he's singing in that Wellsprings Victory Church for nothing? It's because you gave him everything. But take those things away from him and see if he cannot curse you. But I'm here to tell you, when, you are in, when you're passionately in love with God, it doesn't matter. The devil can take everything from you, but you still are going to say Jesus is Lord. You're going to praise God even when you're hurting. You're going to praise. I'm taking, telling you, passion is not what we make it out to be. We think if somebody's passionate, means they are happy all the time. No, that's not what it is. It is even when they are in pain, Jesus is still Lord. They may be weeping, Jesus is still Lord. And I'm telling you, they may not have money in their bank account, Jesus is still Lord. They, I'm telling you, there may be some difficulties in their lives, they, they still cannot change the confession of their mouth, that Jesus is still Lord. Job, he lost everything. He lost everything, all his kids, everything. His wife even came and said, Job, well, what, why do you have to suffer like this? His body was full of abscess, and he was dying. And Job said, his wife said, well, if you curse God right now, then you die quick. You don't have to go through the pain. Thinking about euthanasia. I heard now you can choose to die and doctors can help you out. It's a new thing that is coming in Canada. Oh, man. But we're going to stand up. I mean, we pray for our doctors and our nurses. You know, they're going to stand up. Somebody want to do that, you can do it. It's up to you. But I'm telling you, just do it quick. His wife said, you curse God and die so we can get over with it. He said, no. I'm not going to do that. How can somebody be in a place like that and praise God? Your passion, 
your passion. You think about Paul and Silas. They're in jail. Everybody's crying, oh, me, poor me, I'm in jail. They started 12 o'clock at night, midnight hour, hallelujah. And they started to sing a song, and they begin to praise the name of the Lord. And angels of the Lord came and delivered them, praise God. And I'm telling you, you don't, your circumstances should not determine your passion. Your passion for God is not determined because of things are going right for you. But if you are passionate about God, in difficult times, Jesus is Lord. In happy times, Jesus is Lord. You have money, Jesus is Lord. You don't have money, Jesus is still Lord. Can somebody say amen? amen. And that's what passion is. But I'm telling you, the devil is after your passion. He wanted to steal your passion. Are you still passionate for God? Just as you were when you first got saved. That's the question. Being passionate is more than just being dedicated. I, <laughs> I, I wanted to bring that up. I, these are things that God has been putting. God is asking me, Pastor David, are you just dedicated or are you passionate? Come on, turn to somebody and say, are you passionate? Or are you just dedicated? You see, if you're dedicated, that means that's all what you get. Now, there's nothing wrong in being dedicated. You can be dedicated to all the things you do, but you are not passionate. You are not passionate. You are just doing it out of a routine. Or you become religious. The, the Pharisees are very good at that. They are dedicated to something now. But they are not passionate about it. And, and I'm telling you, sometimes in, 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 in is a picture of Christ and the church Marriage, people are married people, I see. Oh, they are passionate. And now all what they have is dedication. That's just a routine now. Well, I, I, you know, that's all what you have. And then we look at God. We are passionate about him. We started going to church. And we are going out of passion. And your passion is getting deflated. And it's going down. And it's going down. But now you have to still come in just because if you don't come, Pastor David's going to call you. <laughs> Why do I have to call people? Lord. But I like doing it. Sometimes get me in trouble. But I'm going to do it. I'm a pastor. I like to call people. Hey, Brother James. He's actually calling me. I like that. James calls me. Hallelujah. We need to call each other. But I'm telling you, your passion for God, get it just goes down and down. Now you're just coming because, you know, if you don't come, what are people going to say? See, no, no. See, again, people, the fear of man. Let nobody be the reason you're coming to church. You're coming to church because you love your God. Hallelujah. And you're going to dance before the Lord. Even if you shout it loud, don't worry about what somebody's going to think. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, we are going to, our passion for God has to increase. Hallelujah. I want my passion for God to be even better than when I first started out. Aren't we supposed to go from glory to glory? Hey? Not from glory to nothing. No, from glory to glory. And from glory to to glory. Hallelujah. And, and we are going to be passionate people. Your passion is what the devil is scared of. The devil is scared of people that are passionate. And we think, oh, if, they are, if he's passionate, why is he so sad? No, it's just you're going through a season where things are difficult. You may look sad, but you're determined. You're going to come through, hallelujah. Weeping may tarry through the night, but joy comes in the morning, hallelujah. You may be weeping at night, but God said you stick in there, stay there in the morning. There's a time of joy, hallelujah. I'm telling you, your joy is going to be worthwhile. The greater the suffering, the greater your hallelujah. 
Because you have seen a breakthrough, you have gone through difficult times. You're going to dance like you've never danced before. You're going to rejoice like you never rejoiced before. You're going to rejoice. You don't care what people think about you. King David can give us an example of being passionate. One day, King David, the greatest weapon you can have those days is to have God on your side. Come and turn to somebody. And say the greatest weapon you can have in your life is to have God on your side. Because you are on the winning side. Hallelujah. You are on the winning side. And that's the best weapon you can have. Eh? You can be only you or two of you. But you are in the majority as far as God is concerned. David... They had something that, if you read in the Old Testament, is as big as this table. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. Moses, the articles of the Ten Commandments are in there. There was a rod that Aaron had. It was put in there. And the manna, the food, some of the manna that came from heaven was there. And that box was put inside. And on top of the box... They have a, a, a angels kind of standing on top of it. It's drawn on it. And they carry that thing. It has a wooden handle on this side. It has to be carried by men. It's very heavy, made out of gold. There's still people looking for that box still today. It can be a fortune. The Ethiopians think they have it. Now, that is disputable. But they have a place... Heavily guarded in Ethiopia today that the box is there. Now that box, if you have it, that means you have the presence of God. But the problem is, if you read the story, Samuel, prophet Eli was the high priest. He was the, the prophet those days and he failed he allowed his sons in the church, in the temple, to sleep with the women, to steal from whatever's going on. Everything was going bad. Then God raised Samuel. And Samuel was in that temple as a little boy. And Eli was trying to raise him, basically to replace Eli one day. But the sons of Eli took one day, the, the Philistines are coming. And the Philistines are coming to fight the Israelites. And those days, what do you do? Four men, they carry that thing, and they walk ahead of everybody else. They just carry that thing, and they shout the name of God, and their enemy gets scattered, they get destroyed, Angels go there and finish them off. They just have to carry that thing and go to fight. So what happened is, in order for you to be carrying this, your life has to align with what you're carrying. I mean, this is the presence of God. I'm telling you, the reason most of us cannot experience the presence of God is because we don't know what it takes to be able to carry the presence of God. These people, the sons of uh, Eli, they were living in sin, open rebellion against God. But they still, when they had a need, when their enemy is coming, they said, oh, let's just go and carry that thing. They should have gone and repented and said, Lord, we are sorry. But they carried it anyway. Sometimes we get to a place where we don't examine ourselves if we are walking in the Lord. And immediately something comes up and we call out, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. It is true. But it's your life in alignment with the purposes of God. So they carried it anyways. And they were going to their enemy. For the first time in the history of Israel, this thing was stolen from them. It is like you're going against somebody with a nuclear bomb. And they could win. But this time, that nuclear bomb couldn't work for them. This thing was supposed to fight for the children of Israel. But they went and they carried in there and they lost the battle to the Philistines. 
And guess what? The Philistines even took this thing from them. What is supposed to give them power has now been taken from them. And the Philistines took it to their land. And they begin to shout. And they took it to their temple. And they put it in front of their God, who is an idol. And they say, you are more powerful than the God of Israel. That was a mistake. But God just allowed that to happen. And then years later, David became a king of Israel. David became a king of Israel. But he was a king without the Ark of the Covenant. He was a king that didn't have the presence of God in Jerusalem, and that bothered him. And I'm telling you, we should be bothered if the presence of God is not there. Uh, David was so passionate for God that he could not keep on keeping on because the presence of God is not there. I, I'm telling you, we can do all kinds of things. Everything will look good. We can polish the place up. But if the presence of no God is not there, it should bother us. And David was so bothered by it. And he wanted it. So one day he saw this thing coming up the hill. Remember I told you it has to be carried by men, four men. Men that have cleansed themselves up, walking with God. But the Philistines don't know anything. They took that thing and they put it on top of a, a bullock. Like a, a, it's probably a, a cow, two cows pulling something. Or maybe two horses. And they put it in the back and... It's being pulled. But that was not how God intended it should be carried. It was supposed to be carried by men. And David was so passionate. I mean, he was so passionate. He said, whoa, 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 finally, finally. And he sent all the men. And they said, let's get it now. We'll go to Jerusalem. And we'll bring the presence of God to the city of Jerusalem. And finally, I have the presence of God. I have the power of God. And now the presence of God is with me. Nobody can mess up with me again. God is with me. But let me tell you, sometimes when we are so passionate, we need to get here. David was so passionate. While you are so passionate about something, you are going to overlook certain things. Remember I told you God is in the details. When he told Noah, you build the ark, he gave him all the measurements. But Noah followed it through. God is in the details. How that ark of the covenant was coming to Jerusalem, they, David sent his men and the thing is going on the back of a donkey or whatever that was carrying it. And for whatever reason, this thing begins to go like this. Boo. Boo. It's trying to tip over. Because God was not happy it was being carried. Not according to his ways, but according to what the Gentiles. There are certain things that are done, that are done according to the world. Not according to the ways of God. But because these things have been away for a long time, the children of Israel, David didn't go to the book to find out the details of how this is supposed to be done. So what did he do? He just wanted to keep on keeping on the way the world did it. On the back of a donkey or the back of a cart, and they're carrying it. But this thing is trying to tip off. But God was not pleased. They should have asked, why is trying, this thing trying to tip off? But they immediately want to stabilize it. There are men that went and, a man went and he wanted to stabilize it. And guess what? These are one of the terrible stories in the Old Testament. The Bible says God struck him death. And he died. Everybody jumped out of there and ran away. Even David, everybody abandoned it. Because they didn't follow the instructions that God has told them. And I'm telling you, some of us, we feel like that. We feel like everything is going this way and something is going like that. And, and, and things are not, you, and we want to stabilize it. But we haven't gone to B-I-B. 
B-L-E, the Bible. Maybe the reason things are going this way and that way is because we haven't followed God's instructions, the Bible. So David, this thing, everybody, now if something is killing people, who is going to touch it? But it happened, this thing fell right in front of a house, opposite. And the guy who fell in front of his house, he would have called the police and said, I don't want this thing here, it's killing people. His name was Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom said, wow. You know who was Obed-Edom? He was a member of King David's worship team. Hallelujah. He was a worshiper, a God-fearing man. Because his life was right. This thing was taken to his house. They said, okay, guys, because he's killing people, just push it. They say, Brandon is living here. We'll push it to Brandon's house. <laughs> but that's not fair, David. This thing is killing people and you're putting it in Brandon's house. So Obed Edom was the guy who took it. Next day, people came and checked. Is anybody dead yet? No. No. Two days later, three days later, hey, he's working for Obed Edom. We wonder what is the secret. He must be having a secret of how to handle that thing. They, this thing killed somebody just now, but in Obed Edom's house, nothing happened to him. So there must be a reason. I, I studied that and I found Obed Edom. He's an Edomite. You know, the Edomites are like the least. People, they are not even part of the Israelis. They're, they're, but he was an Edomite. But he was a worshiper. I'm telling you, he worshipped God. He was part of the worship team. And I'm telling our worship team, if you are in the worship team, don't just be average. Go give it all to Jesus. Hallelujah. Be like obey Edom. Even the presence of God turns out to be a blessing. But if you don't handle it right, so King David told the man, I want that thing. You see, King David was so passionate, he wanted the presence of God. Even after he killed somebody, he said, no, I have to find out why is it working in that guy's house. The Bible says Obed-Edom was blessed. That anybody that went to obed imagine you want to be having a reputation that anybody that comes to your house, immediately they get blessed. Because you are blessed. I, I like that. And people come to my house, they are blessed. Because I am blessed. So King David became jealous. <laughs> you know, we, sometimes we become jealous because somebody has a car. We, we become jealous because somebody has money. We become jealous maybe somebody has a beautiful wife. Something. But I'm telling you, there is one thing you can become jealous about. And the Bible used that word covet, to covet, covetousness. You can apply that to God. You covet the things of God. Not people, not what people have. You can covet. David was coveting the presence of God. He wanted it. Hallelujah. Eh? The Bible says desire spiritual gifts. Means you covet it. Means you really wanted it. God has no problem in that. Sometimes we covet cars and houses. But this is what David wanted that. So he went and read it again. Come on, say, I'm going to read it again. You can read the Bible again. And figure out how did I get it wrong at the first place. Maybe I can get it right the second time. So King David, he read it again. And he said, oh, yeah, right, just like that instruction manual. Uh, they, we didn't get it because we, we were doing it the wrong way. The instruction manual says that this time we're going to do it this way. And after that, oh, that's really easy. So David went and he said, oh, our problem is God says that we are supposed to carry this thing, not to be carried by a card. You know, in our modern day today, we should have got a... a, a for the F-150, we'll put it in there. It will carry that thing for us. God said, no, it has to be carried by man. And so he went 
And he did that. And you know what happened? And everything went good. And they sacrificed for God. And they carried that thing again. And this time, nobody's hurt. Hallelujah. Isn't that good not to be hurt? Uh, the presence of God is with you. And David got musicians. Praise God for a worship team. And they were singing. It is like the parade that you see they have here. Of course, this is a different parade. This is a real parade for Jesus. And they are carrying the, the, the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant was being carried to Jerusalem. And the people begin to dance and sing. And King David said, wow, I'm so passionate. And he took his gown. I'm telling you, those gowns, are, some of you are wearing heavy jackets here. I don't know. David didn't want anything to hinder him when he's worshiping God. So he took his gown out. He took his clothes. He just left with pajamas. I don't know what was that. Maybe I, I just, you know. And he started to dance because, and he danced like nobody's watching. His wife saw it. And his wife said, how dare you? You are a king. You shouldn't be dancing like that. And God was not pleased with his wife. It's a fact. You read it in the Bible. The Bible says God was angry with King David's wife, Michal, that she could not bear a child. Now, do you know that she should have gone back and repented? I see, this is the same God. But David, he cares less even what his wife think. Right? And he wanted to worship the Lord. <laughs> he was so passionate. And he danced before the Lord because the presence of God is coming to Jerusalem. I'm telling you, the presence of God is what should make you come out of your hiding place. That place of intimidation. That place of what would people think about me. I don't care what people think about me. I've got something coming. God, the presence of God is all what I care about. They are singing about him, and he is already rejoicing over me with singing. God is rejoicing over me with singing. I need to respond. So our worship should be a response to what God is already doing to us. If he's singing, he doesn't have to sing to me. You go to Saudi Arabia, the king of Saudi Arabia is not singing over his people. They are the ones singing probably to him. But God loves you. And he is doing what we should be doing. And he is doing it real well with all his heart. He's passionate. God is passionate. Hallelujah. Your passion reveals what is in your heart. You might be dedicated to something simply because you are keeping your vow. But your heart is far from it. See, if you, yeah, you can be doing something just because you are dedicated, because it is what is required. But your heart is full from it, far from it. Look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So it becomes a lip service. God is not interested in lip service. He wants you to be passionate. Hallelujah. He wants you to be passionate. He wants you to be involved in it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Remember the passion you had for the Lord when you first gave your life to Jesus. Remember the excitement and the enthusiasm you felt. Sometimes life disappointments and difficulties causes us to lose some of our passion. Sometimes it is just the passing of time that causes our love for God to become a routine. Sometimes the passing of time, it causes our love to become a routine. If your faith has become a routine, you have lost your passion. If your faith has become a routine, you've lost your passion. Your passion. It's time to change that. Amen? Amen. Don't live another day of dull routine and passion, passionless Christianity. Here are three steps to experiencing an increase in your passion for God. Can somebody say amen? amen. Make up your mind. Hallelujah. Make up your mind that you are going to regain your passion. You have to make up your mind. Come on, say, I'm making my mind. 
I've got my mind made up to praise the Lord. I've got my mind made up to praise the Lord. You have to make up your mind. Yeah, I've got my mind made up. I'm going to the house of the Lord. King David again, a man who's full of passion. He said, I was glad and very glad when they told me to go to the house of the Lord. That's there. The passion is right there. He was not just going. He was glad that somebody told him to go there. Sometimes it is just the passing of time. Now here are three we made that make up your mind. Confess that you have lost your passion. Right? Make up your mind, but you have to confess that you have lost your passion. How did you lose it? Where did you lose it? What was the circumstances that resulted to you losing your passion? We all know that. You don't have to tell me. I don't have to tell you. I know it. Where my passion for God is getting dra drained. It's, it's like a, a tire that is leaking. Right? And very soon your car is going like that because the one tire is flat. I'm telling you, we need to regain our passion. So you know it, but you have to confess that, Lord, I have lost my passion. I'm not like how I used to be. I'm not reading my Bible like how I used to be. I'm not even excited as I used to be when Pastor David preaches. Pastor David's message is, all, is the same like how then, but how are you not excited? It's just because you've lost your passion. See, passion, a passionate Christian is what the devil is afraid of. Somebody who's made their mind. I've got my mind made up. I've settled that long time when I give my life to the Lord, when I go through that baptism, that I am not going to forsake the assembling together of the saints. Mark, if you read that in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. I'm going to the house of the Lord, going to church that I settled it long time ago is not even to be discussed. I'm getting up and I'm going to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. You're passionate. Number three is take action. Take action. God will do his part to increase your passion. But he also expects you to do your part. Can somebody say amen? When you declare a fast and set aside time to pray. Oh, Pastor David is back into fasting again. Oh, you see, David is a passionate man. I was talking to Philip the other day. How King David. King David was so passionate for God. Saul was his enemy. Saul trying to kill him. Saul hunted him down so many times. Even threw a spear at David. While David was playing his guitar. He was there to play guitar. So that the presence of God can come into the house. So that Saul, who was possessed with evil spirits, the spirits can leave him. How can you throw a spear on somebody who's helping you out? And that's the, what Saul did. But when Saul died, he was killed by the Philistines. This is what David did. He took one week where he fasted and he prayed and he mourned without eating food and he called a lot of people and he wept and wept for Saul. I mean, this is something a lot of people would not do. Some people cannot weep even if their cat died, let alone a person. But David is crying and he is weeping for Saul, who also at any time was planning to kill him because Saul died. I mean, David knew that Saul was anointed by God. David always wanted to be on the right side of God. I'm telling you. And he wanted the presence of God. And the presence of God, we have to do certain things different. The world will say that you're supposed to repay evil for evil, but God say don't. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it here. Let's all stand. And we need to pray that God will strengthen us, that our passion for him will increase. Hallelujah. So I wanted you to just lift your hands to the Lord. I'm going to pray that the Lord will strengthen you. Hallelujah. That your passion will grow. Your passion will increase. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your people. That Lord, as far as our passion is concerned, that we will not, Father God, sell out. We will not give in. We will not be pushed. We will not be intimidated. For we are children of the Most High God. We are passionate for God. For He is passionate and He's singing to us. He loves us and we respond in a like manner. That we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. Strengthen us. Restore our passion. In Jesus' mighty name. And God's people say amen.